Hi there. In our series, Fighting Men of Rhodesia, we've produced nine interviews so far. And um, for our 10th podcast, I thought it might be good to touch on some of the points uh, of interest that um, have been raised during some of the interviews. Um, firstly, I want to talk about the tragic line attack um, on um, Lieutenant Al Tour, who... Um, won the Bronze Cross of Rhodesia. Uh, he was an ex-RLI officer and um, and was also uh, formerly a company sergeant major, a CSM. Um, and on the 9th of April, 1972, um, Don Price mentioned the, the lion attack. And <clears throat> funny enough, shortly after watching that video, I, I watched another video um, from a guy who has an excellent channel called Five Romeo Romeo, where he describes the, the lion attack uh, resulting in Len Harvey's death um, in an episode called Shumba. A mere five days after Len Harvey's death, about 450 kilometers west, another deadly attack took place uh, in the Bumi Hills area uh, of Lake Kariba. After, and just to give you a bit of background, after Al Tull's commissioning, um, he'd been posted as OC to the Rhodesian Army Tracker Combat Training Wing at Kariba. And um, in those days, it still fell under the command of the School of Infantry in Guelo. He was a highly respected soldier's soldier, uh, and all of those who served under him uh, regarded him very, uh, he was held in very high regard. And he was also uh, the winner of uh, many shooting contests, busily type of shooting contests, including the coveted uh, President's uh, Medal. <coughs> and in one contact with the Turs, he personally accounted for six enemy insurgents. Let me read you his BCR citation. Warrant Officer, Second Class Albert Knight Turl. 1st Battalion, the Rhodesian Light Infantry, for gallantry and leadership in action on two occasions in engagements against terrorists. Sergeant Major Tull's outstanding qualities of leadership and readiness to seize the initiative had resulted in successes for the security forces. During one engagement when his troop commander, who was less advantageously placed, could not issue orders because of a faulty radio set, Sergeant Major Tull redeployed his troop into stop positions of his own initiative. As this involved shouting words of command to troopers around him, he became the subject of concentrated enemy fire. But in spite of the danger, he continued to direct operations until the terrorist position was surrounded. In this action, sorry, this action led to the elimination of all nine terrorists. Con uh, contacted, with at least six of these being accounted for by Sergeant Major Tull himself. His complete disregard for his own safety and his very fine personal example under conditions of extreme danger was an inspiration to all. That was his um, citation. The Tracker Combat Wing um, trained those with an aptitude for tracking uh, as well as Special Forces and Air Force personnel in the art of survival bushcraft. The instructors themselves were highly skilled soldiers, many of them with a lot of combat experience, and they were also, um, I would say, woodsmen with bushcraft skills. Um, and the training area was on the southern shores of Lake Kariba, near the Bumi Hills. Um, it's a vast, rugged area, wild animals, tsetse flies, and uh, and and really, in a way, perfect for uh, for that those type of conditions. But yeah, lots of dangerous big game like uh, buffalo, elephant, lion, leopard, hyena, crocodiles, hippos, um, all of all of the good African all of the good African stuff. At the time of the attack, uh, Lieutenant Turl, together with a sergeant from the RLI called Pete Clements and uh, Andre Rabi from the SAS, we're running an advanced tracking course um, in the Bumi Hills area um, 
near Siakovu in the Ome Tribal Trust land, about 37 kilometers south of, the, of Bumi Hills itself. Their vehicles have been left at the district commissioner's camp at Siakovu, and the course was a mix of RLI and SAS soldiers. Um, it was late autumn, early winter, uh, and that evening was unusually cold with with, uh, with a type of drizzle and mist that Rhodesians called Guti. I grew up in the Chipinga area and we used to get a lot of Guti. Um, one of the groups of soldiers made a small fire to dry out and keep warm, even though this was not standard operating procedure. Pete Clement. Okay, I'd like to break into this video at this point. When I released the first um, episode of the L2 line attack, I think it was Fighting Men of Rhodesia, or it is Fighting Men of Rhodesia, episode 10. The main sources of information that I had were those available to me on books that have been written on the subject and uh, of what was available online and from listening to, um, uh, to people like uh, Don Price who had been um, at the combat tracking school. Um, but, um, yeah... So based on that research and that information, I, I, I released, if you like, the first edition of, of this uh, incident. Um, once it was released online, um, I was contacted uh, by the Turl family, um, who are very supportive of our channel, and um, they suggested to me that I should talk to Major Fred Watts, who was actually present at at this incident. In fact, he was sitting right next to Al Tull when the lions attacked. And also, you know, him being, in fact, the only surviving witness of this attack. He's an eyewitness. He was actually sitting right next to Al when it happened. And also, he, he's the only person alive, who's still alive, of the four people who were there when it happened. I contacted um, Fred Watts, who was extremely gracious, and and he wrote to me uh, the following, which I would like to read out to you. There were only four of us in the group. There were Alto, Andre Rabi, Clive Young and myself. Clive and I were the students in training. Um, Pete Clements was in the other group that was approximately 45 kilometers east of us. Andre Bestbeer, who was a good friend of mine, was in that group, which also had Stretch Franklin in it. They were closest to the district commissioner's camp. For the last kilometer or so before we caught Clive and Andre, we heard the lions on a ridge to the south of where we finally bivvied up for the night. Prior to the lion attack, Clive and Andre had retired to their bivvy, leaving Al and myself on two rounded rocks, chatting over what was left of the coals of our fire. Just prior to the attack, Al moved off to relieve himself, and when he returned, we swapped seats on the rock. We did not hear or sense any of the startling revelations that were about to explode upon us, as noises were overshadowed by the gooty that was falling. The night exploded with, with the roar of two lions jumping us from behind. The lion that hit Al caught him chest height around his neck and into his back. By the time they hit the ground, it had managed to break his neck. I spun off to the right with the force of the lions and was lucky only to be mauled on my chest and on the side of my face. I grabbed my rifle and double tapped over the lion who had already started dragging Al off into the bush. The lion dropped Al and then Andre, Clive and myself made our way to Al. As we got to him, the lion came back for more. Both Andre and myself let off another volley in the direction of the, of the lion, which luckily for us turned and headed back into the bush. The lions remained in the area all night, but did not bother us again. A wounded lion was uh, caught in a snare and shot by the district commissioner two days later. 
When we try to make comms with Kariba and, and Pete Clements, we managed to raise Pete, but not Kariba. The company that was based in Kariba was being stood down the next day, so they had taken their relay team off the relay position, which was the reason for no comms. This is when the plan was hatched for Pete and whoever, as it turned out probably Andre Bespier, to make their way back to the district commissioner's camp to radio for help. I can't comment on any statements or happenings as I was not with them. However, some of that group joined up with us during the course of the evening and as first light approached, the task of cutting a Lima Zulu or landing zone was managed. By the time the message got to Kariba, there was a serious static storm overhead which negated any helicopter evacuation. Hence the doctor's trip by a boat during the night, as it would turn out. The chopper managed to pick the dock up as they reached Bumi and brought him straight to us. For Andre and myself it was a long evening. Several of the facts mentioned in your original video were not correct. Al was paralyzed from the neck down with no feeling at all. He talked for most of the night and was getting weaker by the minute. There was no letter, but he spent a great deal of time telling us what to tell Molly. By the time the chopper arrived and landed, Al had passed on. We loaded Al onto the chopper and I decided to go back with him. We arrived in Kariba, where Molly met us at the landing zone. I spent most of the day consoling her and passing on Al's messages. So... Um, out of respect to to Al and his family, uh, I withdrew the original video in order to straighten out the facts as given to me by Fred Watts, for which I'm extremely grateful. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, and and so that's actually what happened. And um, I just wanted to re-release this video with the actual eyewitness uh, account given by Fred Watts, thank you. The lioness. Sergeant Clemens felt it was imperative that they get to their uh, vehicles at Siokobu in order to get help, help for Al. Um, and he called for volunteers to go with him. Uh, a South African Special Forces soldier by the name of Andre Bestbeer volunteered to go with Pete Clements for help. And it was about a five kilometer run through the rugged bush to Siokobu and Clements and Best Beer didn't hesitate and took off into the dark, fully aware that they could become a target. Throughout their run, in fact, they could hear lions vocalizing around them. And the Gooty mist didn't make it any easier for them, but they were but they were not attacked. Once they reached the vehicles, they drove about thirty seven kilometers to Boomi Hills and radioed the police in Kariba to summons uh, Dr. Peter Chatterton. Um, due to the bad visibility, uh, a chopper couldn't be dispatched that, that night, remember, with all the mist and everything. Um, and so the doctor was brought across to uh, the lake in a police launch from Kariba. Clements and Bestbia drove to Katete Harbour uh, in their Land Rover to await the doctor's arrival. That night of horror began at 19... 30 hours or 7.30 in the evening um, and the brave Al Turl eventually succumbed to his wounds and injuries at about 0445 or quarter to five in the morning. The doctor could basically do nothing for him. Uh, the chopper arrived at about 0630 hours, uh, although the visibility still hindered uh, flying. And throughout the or ordeal, Al Turl remained conscious um, and uncomplaining. Um, Turl's composure and acceptance of his predicament was a fine example uh, to the young soldiers who were with him. As befitting this exceptional RLI officer, he was accorded a full military funeral. The soldier, the soldiers often referred to him as ever smiling Al Turl. He was a professional Rhodesian soldier, and as such, this is history that is worth remembering. I'm of the opinion, and, I, and, I, and I'm no expert, but I'm of the opinion 
um, that um, the local Batonka and Vodoma tribes in that area had a primitive um, tradition of leaving their aged and infirm out in the bush to be consumed by larger predators such as lion and hyena. And perhaps this otherwise healthy uh, lioness had become accustomed to, to humans as legitimate prey, um, but we'll never, we'll never really know. Lastly, I wanted to um, mention that if you enjoy uh, watching these videos, um, you might like to consider becoming part of our, part of our community uh, and supporting our work via Patreon. Um, Patreon uses the idea of patronage, which is actually a really old idea. Um, if it weren't for patrons, um, we wouldn't have Romeo and Juliet, the Mona Lisa, uh, Mozart, Shakespeare, or Da Vinci. Um, and, and they all had patrons. Um, but if any of you would like to support our channel and support our work, um, uh, then please consider looking at our Patreon page and, and choosing a level uh, of support that you'd like to give us. It might be as little as $3 a month. Um, all, every little bit helps. Trust me. I mean, I, for example, Hannes and I um, are having great difficulty um, getting communications set up with Daryl, who's in a primitive area of, of the Zambian bushveld. And it may be that the only solution is for both of us or, to go up there and actually um, film an interview with Daryl where we don't rely on dodgy internet connections and that type of thing. And certainly I think Daryl has so many interesting stories to tell um, that it would be worthwhile doing something like that. But neither of us can really afford the time uh, or the expense of of going all the way to Zambia to interview Daryl. Nevertheless, I think an interview like that would be epic and, and well worth doing. But if we had some financial support that could justify us uh, taking time out to do that. So really, um, by becoming part of our support network and support community, you are enabling us to continue making these historic videos and 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 able to capture for posterity some of our Rhodesian military history. Thanks very much for watching, guys.